morning, everybody. Happy Sunday. I hope that you are having a magnificent Sunday, no matter where you are. It is great to see you all. I can't believe that we are already in June. First, I'm going to say that it is a peaceful day here. It has been raining for the last couple of days in the morning, as is pretty typical in Vancouver. We happen to be in a rainforest. I hope everybody's having an absolutely wonderful day. I am checking to see if I can read comments. Yes, I can. Welcome everyone. Welcome Catherine, Lily, Emily. So great to see you all. Extra special thanks to everyone who has joined the Extra Scoop Club. I really appreciate your support. We are going to have a lot of fun with that coming up. On the 15th of June, I'm going to be sending out a poll, and that poll is going to ask what day and time works best for everyone in order to do our Extra Scoop Club Extra Special Live. And I'll do a few different options to try to make sure that we can do this for everyone. Good morning, Cindy. Hey, my jewelry addiction, Tanya, great to see you. Marlene, Teresa, Uniques by the Creek, wonderful to see you all. Thank you. My necklace is appropriate for the show. It is all on book teams and we'll be talking about lockets too. And I thought that I'd best wear one for you. This is one of my favorite topics. I think I say that often, but I really love Victorian jewelry and I love a statement necklace. And there's something about silver that is extra special. I think in part it's that it's still accessible. Sometimes you can find a really good deal. And these pieces, while hard to come by, can be found in the wild too. Hey Kirsten, hey Donna, good morning to everybody. It is so good to see you all. So first I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my fascination with book chains. They are beautiful statement pieces. And in the Victorian era, era especially in the early parts, um, women wore very large jewelry, so big statement pieces. And this is in part because they had large garments, some big collars too. So when they were wearing a necklace, if it was like a big jet necklace, um, large beads, it was usually something that could be seen. Now, once upon a time, way back before we had our iPhones, before cameras were commonplace, remember before digital cameras, there were other compact cameras, then SLRs, go back way before that, people only had paintings and portrait miniatures to capture their likenesses. Well, in the 19th century, the innovation of photography changed that and lockets became really popular as a means of being able to put a photo of loved ones and carry it with you. So that replaced some of the hair jewelry that you saw because people really wanted a likeness. So that's in part why they became popular. But we're gonna do a deep dive today all about book chain jewelry. Book chains were particularly um, sought after, especially in the Victorian period. And then there was a resurgence in the Art Deco period as well. But there's some pretty big differences and ways to identify them. So we'll make sure that we cover all of that. Hey, Jane. Hey, Lisa. It's so good to see you all. So without further ado, I want to start by sharing a photo that shows you exactly what I mean by large Victorian jewelry. So here we have a beautiful woman. And if you look at her necklace, it is really something else. And not only is she wearing a necklace, she's got a brooch on too. Um, these are statement pieces. Now, book chains, while generally not quite as large, definitely do have a wonderful presence too. And so here is an example of a book chain. I wanted to show you what I mean when I talk about a book chain. And we're gonna talk a little bit about why they're called book chains to start with. So in my hands here is one of my favorites. These were called book chains in part because they looked flat and on the sides, almost like a book's binding. Now that was one of the reasons they were called book chains. The other and less well-known reason is because they were sometimes used as bookmarks. So. If a lady was having a lovely nighttime read by the candle, or maybe she had an oil lamp by her bed, she would remove her large book chain. And because they were relatively flat, it could lie nicely inside a book and then be closed up. Now, truth be told, I don't do that with my book chains. I don't like to sandwich my jewelry in anything, but it is a fascinating piece of history. And part of the reason why I'm holding this specific book today is because one of the pennants we're gonna be talking about, this one right here, a large and in charge citrine actually came from the family 
that wrote this book. And this book is about the history of a specific Scottish butcher shop in Vancouver. And so we're going to play a dating game later and that will come into play, but I'll tell you a little bit about it as we go on. So let's jump back into book chains. And we're going to start with the anatomy of a book chain because I think it makes sense to get us all on the same page. Book chains have many different looks and feels, but they do have some very similar characteristics. So let's start here. In the image that you see right now, you see a locket, you see a drop section, and you also see a large bolt or spring ring and the chain itself. So let's break it down. We've got the chain, and in this case, as is fairly typical, you're going to see links that are interspersed with those that look like book bindings. Now, I'm going to remove this photo for just a second and show you what this one looks like. This one is a really interesting three-dimensional example, and it really does look like book bindings alternating on either side that look a lot like bows. Okay, let's keep going. So here, I'm showing it suspended so that you can see what is on the ends. And typical to book chains from the Victorian period, they are going to have these open sort of locked spaces where you can slip your spring ring through. Now, there's two ways that you can see these. One where there's sort of a fixed hoop and then another one where there's no hoop at all. So let's take a look here too. You can see these fixed hoop. I do have a ring going through this one. And this is very, very typical of the Victorian pieces. Now, sometimes they would just be the flat link and then you would pass your hoop through, but you would usually see the same thing on both sides of your chain. Welcome all, it is wonderful to see you. Marlene, I see your question and I will absolutely address how I got started with collecting and learning about jewelry in a little bit. Now, with these necklaces, it is not common to find them with their drop anymore. And I'm going to show you what I mean by the drop. It is this Y link. That is what they're referred to. And really it's because it creates a Y almost like a lavalier. But as we're going to see, once upon a time, it was actually very common for these necklaces to come with them. And they were used to help suspend lockets or other pieces. Now, spring rings do come in all sizes. These have been around for almost 200 years. And you can sort of date them sometimes based on the thumb component or the push clasp that is on them. Some have a very small or handcrafted clasp. The um, Art Deco period and just around the turn of the century had some where you could slip your thumbnail in. And then the other variety that you're going to see is where they have a bolt already built onto them. Now that's an example that we can see underneath the Y link with the drop. These Y links again were used largely for suspension and they helped add extra versatility to the chain. So on the left, you can see where I have it suspended so that you can add that link in or your spring ring in and it's available right there. And then I've added it on in the next image so that you can kind of envision what I mean. Now with these Y links, these come off completely. It is almost like a necklace extender, which is nice. It adds a little bit of length. You can choose to wear it or not. And another common type of Y-link was just pieces of a chain like this. So these were really interchangeable and quite suitable to be worn with many necklaces. So I love having this one. I wear it on most necklaces other than the one that has this Y-link. All right. Good morning all, Soho California Vintage, Sue, T. Marie, great to see you all, Fleur de Montagne. Before we keep going, I will acknowledge the question of how did I get into vintage jewelry? Well, jewelry has been a lifelong love for me. I still remember going to a flea market growing up in Montreal at a very early age with my parents. I think I had like $3 and I managed to find a little tiny religious pendant. And that pendant had a tiny piece of wheat inside of it and it was meant to belong to a painter and saint. And that is kind of what set me off. I must have been about eight or nine years old and I started researching things and I've always loved older pieces of anything. So, I mean, weekends were spent polishing silver at my grandparents' house. I, I actually, 
learned something very interesting the other day. They say that if you want your children to do a behavior, you should tell them they are the best at it. And I can still remember being told that I was the best silver polisher. So I don't know if that's why I loved polishing silver and always wanted to do it, or if it's just that I wanted to touch these old things that included like horse racing cups and cutlery and all sorts of wonderful tableware, but I have always loved jewelry. Now, as I grew older, I continued to collect, but I, like everyone else, started to gravitate towards more modern pieces. And then in my early 20s, I realized that these more modern pieces had such a heavy retail markup on them that often I could get vintage pieces for less money than new ones that were made of higher quality materials. So instead of buying just like a sterling ring at the store in the mall, I would be able to find maybe a beautiful gold ring at a pawn shop. So that's what continued uh, the, the search for me and realizing that I could find some wonderful pieces. And of course, researching and you know learning more about them is my love. So let's continue with book chains. Uh, I, Chris, I do still have that pendant. I'm going to have to dig it out and I'll share it with you all. It is in a jewelry box. It is teeny, teeny, tiny, just a silver plate little thing, but I'll, I'll dig it out for you all one day. <laughs> Let us continue. I, I keep everything. <laughs> this is a very favorite photo that I've found. Um, and it has three women wearing a lot of beautiful jewelry, but shows a beautiful set of necklaces. And we are going to do a little bit of a deep dive on two of these necklaces. But this photo from around 1880 does showcase how common it was for women to wear them. You can also see their earrings if you look really, really closely. We've got a few different styles of chains. Absolutely wonderful. So I took some time to research and try to find something that would be similar. The woman on the left has a chain on that definitely seems to have that wildling piece in, um, and it seems to have some larger floral pieces because we can see some of the spaces. It's a lot of fun. Now on the right side, it is a little bit more chain based. You can see some of those ball dots too, and those ball dots are actually known as the cannonball design, and they were very, very common in the 1870s and 1880s on everything from necklaces, brooches, pendants, you can see a lot of them. We're going to take a little bit of a journey and look at some historical photos like this and then take a look at some book chains that I've tried to identify so that we can get in really close. Let's begin with this beautiful lady. She's wearing what looks almost like a wide necklace. You can see that Y drop again. And the best rendition that I could find is this sort of pierced star pattern. Um, it has almost like a fabric like appearance when it sits on the neck. It's really very quite beautiful. Next up, this woman is wearing a locket on her neck and she has a more typical chain design. These are fairly easy to still find today and are actually still being reproduced today. So we will cover some tips on how to make sure when you are shopping for a book chain that you are finding one that is period if that is what you're looking for. Otherwise, you can find an economical look as well. And I just want to draw your attention. The way these were commonly worn was actually just under a bar brooch. So we're going to see a lot of different women who have a bar brooch and also their chain too. So jewelry was large and in charge, and it feels like the motto was very much, when in doubt, add something else on, which I absolutely love. Here we have another woman, and again, she's got that Y component, and it looks like she's got a fob, probably a seal, on the bottom of hers. She looks very serious. Remember, sitters in these times in the photos had to sit very still for a while in order to capture the image. And the links are quite flat. Now, this was another very distinctive look, and it allowed it to lie flat against the neck or body. Also served as a fantastic bookmark. Next up, we have a woman wearing a cross. And again, this is kind of a twisted chain look to it. So the closest example I could find is this one here. And this is a bit unusual. Normally they are true book chain links and this appears to not have that same link. It's more of a twisted rope. So I wanted to share that with you. I would still categorize this under the collar necklace. Book chain might be a little bit of a stretch, but 
a lot of fun to look at. Another woman here wearing two necklaces, high collar. She's also got a big floral brooch and several rings on. <laughs> Team Marie. I, I agree. Somehow it doesn't look overdone even when they're wearing this many pieces of jewelry. It's quite amazing. I believe that this one is very sympathetic to what she's wearing. Again, we can see that Y chain that allows it to extend down just a little bit further. A smaller locket is what she's wearing than some of the others that we've seen. And we've got a beautiful gated chain uh, as well as the link. So quite beautiful. Now, these chains did not just come in silver or in sterling. They also came in rolled gold as well. And I do want to talk about rolled gold for just a second, because rolled gold is not the same as gold plate or gold filled. So rolled gold, which was very popular during this period, actually took two pieces of gold, very thinly, like almost like paper fattened out, and then it would put the base metal in between. Those would be adhered through pressure and heat and then rolled out, and that would be used as a raw material to make chain or other pieces of jewelry. Now, this is different from gold plating, which is really electroplating, and gold filled, which has a piece of base metal usually that is being wrapped with one layer of thin gold sheet. Um, so, just wanted to touch on that for a second. We are going to look at a beautiful gold, likely filled chain. And I'm going to pull up a video now so that you can see it in a little bit more detail. There we have it. So we can see in this one, it is beautifully pierced. Again, it's got that book look to it. Now these are always closed too. So when they're soldered closed, you can almost see no detail of workmanship. And there's that closed hoop on the end as well. And then I'm going to show you one more video while we are looking at videos of the first chain with all of its engraving. So when you're looking for a Victorian piece, the handwork is very evident. This is all hand engraved, hand done. And these links, you almost can't find an opening on them. So you see that they're very, very well made. We're going to take a look. Now, all of these flowers have meaning in floriography, which was a Victorian pastime of assigning meaning to flowers. They would be um, used. So we'll talk about that another day. I do also want to just show you these ends, and we're going to come back to these in just a moment. So that covers some of the book chains that we're going to look at. But first, let's take a look at this catalog. I do love looking at old catalogs to find references and inspiration. And here you can see it was fairly typical for them to come with those Y pieces, although they are hard to come by today. So if you do find one and it comes with one, that is like a bonus score for you. Jane, I see your question. Compared to gold plate, rolled gold is a better investment, higher gold content. Yes, that is correct. Rolled gold is considered higher than gold filled, which is higher than gold plate. Gold plate is a minimum of one micron, unless you're in France, and then I believe it is five, but that is a whole different story for another day. So really, really beautiful warm tones to rose gold, Laura. I agree with you. It's wonderful. Um, so here is that necklace. I'm just showing it in its sort of beauty all laid out. Sometimes it's hard to see. And these pieces are fairly large and in charge. Now in the 1940s, there was a resurgence for antique jewelry. And this is a beautiful photo of a movie star who is wearing a book chain and a wonderful three-dimensional pendant, not unlike the one that I'm wearing today, or I should say it is a locket. We have antique jewelry comes out of the past to add an heirloom aura to the newest fashions. This is a quote from a newspaper in 1940. Dainty lapel watches range from simple round gold pieces to a jeweled scarab. They're attached to pins from plain bar orientations, enameled orchids, sorry, ostentatious orchids, uh, cluster rings, heavy gold link bracelets, old fashioned lavalier are bedecking pretty maidens. Catherine, thank you so, so much. I see your super sticker and that is so very kind of you. I really, really appreciate that. So we are segueing into the Art Deco period because these wonderful book chains were born through the early Victorian stages all the way past the turn of the century. 
but in the Art Deco period, they took on a flavor of their own and a flavor of what was going on in the world. They were very much on trend. So colored glass, um, some dangles and collars were all part of the look. And we're gonna take a look at that. But the important thing to know when you're di differentiating these pieces are that often they have a lot of machine made components and the build as well as the closures and clasps are a little bit different. So we are going to take a deep dive now. We're gonna begin with something you know I love, Egyptian Revival Art Deco book chain style. Let's get in close. So this is a fantastic collar necklace. It is Egyptian Revival Art Deco, late 1930s. You've got some scarabs in milk glass, and then you've got enamel, and of course the book chain look, which is really distinctive and quite beautiful. Christina, thank you so much for coming in. Have a great day. Now, if you take a look at that clasp, it is a fold over clasp, and this is typical of the Art Deco period and retro period. We're gonna take a look at the reverse as well. And that is part of what can help us date these things. And it was very common in the Deco period to spend things from the book chain, as we can see. So here's the reverse. You can tell that these components were not handmade. They were likely stamped out and assembled together. So really a very beautiful piece. Here's another example using a shepherd hook, um, meant to again emulate that collar look in the Deco period, but it has a definite nod to book chain. And that's where book chain and collar necklaces are sometimes used synonymously. Here's another fantastic example, very, very similar to the look of the first Art Deco piece. Now we've got some beautiful glass that's been added, a lot of other dangles as well, but you can tell that these links have been stamped. So they are not the handmade Victorian links, they are newer. And this is one of the tips that you can look for when you are shopping. This beautiful piece comes from one of our viewers and it is a beauty. Donna, thank you so much for sharing it with us. Now, if you look closely, there's a lot of special details going on here. We have really stunning glass that's been set beautifully. Um, we've got nice prongs that are holding it in. And then you also have that book chain look around the back and another special clasp closure. So this piece, absolutely stunning. We'll take a look at the back as well. Again, you can see some of that machine fabrication, which was used to create these wonderful pieces. And it is a stunner. Let's get in close. This allows you to see the nice, um, components. And you can also see where they have emulated marcasite as well, surrounding those blue stones. So such a beautiful piece, very well made front and back. Absolutely beautiful. Thank you. Thank you to everyone who shared pictures with me. Now in 1945, we have another example of a really beautiful Chrysler bracelet. And this one is two tones of gold as was very common in the retro period as well. You've got rose and yellow. It's a book chain bracelet. And you can indeed find some wonderful, wonderful bracelets. Now this is an ad from 1945, complete with those retro bows that you would expect to see. Quite a stunning piece. And here is another example of a book chain bracelet. This one has a more familiar nod to the Victorian period. But again, remember these extra dangles that are added and then the closures that we're looking at are most definitely in Art Deco. And then this is another pretender. So this is from my collection and it is an Art Deco necklace that tries very, very hard to look like a Victorian one. And it almost succeeds unless you know to look carefully at the findings. So I am going to show this to you in a video and then we're gonna talk about it a little bit more in detail. Here we go. So take a look at the links. They are beautifully made. And I think my video is not playing. Let me try that again. There we go, get a little bit of movement. Now, the biggest tell is the links that is holding together the scalloped edges. If you look at them, they are very typical 1930s, 1940s with the way they're wrapped. So that is not what one would expect on a book chain, even though it is 
designed to look like one. And again, only on one end do we have that locked finding. The other is a spring ring that has been permanently attached. So that is a telltale sign when I am uh, looking at things to try and date them. So I'm going to show this to you here as well. I will dangle it. So as you can see, this hoop has been permanently attached, but it is not the same as this fixed one. It still works wonderfully with lockets, and I wear it with a locket from the 1880s with a big cherub because it's got scallops on it too. Um, and I do love this as much as I love my other book chains. They do tangle. Now, a little known secret I'm going to tell you about book chains is that these spring rings can be a real hassle to get on and off, especially if you have like longer nails or your nails are done. It makes me laugh because sometimes you think about the ladies' maids that would have helped dress people, especially during the Victorian era. Era, It can be done, but it's something to keep in mind for sure. Now, with these book chains, it is important to know that there is a lot available that is reproduction today. And if you look carefully, sometimes the listings will share those details with you. So I am going to share now a listing from eBay that is extremely clear on what it is. Here we have it. It says reproduction Victorian book chain collar necklace choker 16 to 24 inches gold or silver tone. And they lay out the pricing. You can choose your link, your length. Um, Team Marie, if they are stamped and not at all hand engraved, and it looks like they are machine made and machine closed, then they are likely Art Deco period or later. So this is an example of something that is still being made today and is being made available. So if you're simply looking for the look, this is a really economical way to get it. And you can even choose your length. But it, it is important to know this because sometimes what happens is people buy them, resell them, and eventually they end up on the secondary market. And if they aren't clearly labeled as what they are, that's where people can get into a little bit of trouble. On Etsy, there's also a listing here where there is additional repro book chain links that are available. Now with these, I want to take you in close so that you can get a look. So these are very clearly stamped and not hand engraved. So if you remember back to the video that I showed of the first one, they are all hand engraved, hand wrapped, hand closed. And the backside of this is also indicative of the machine making as well. So these are all really good indicators um, and can help you understand if something is a little bit later or actually a true antique. So I wanted to share that with everyone. And then there was one other important piece to share. Now, these bolt rings have been made for over a century, and it isn't always easy to be able to date them. Sometimes you can look for indicators like this. So if you have a 120th 14K mark on it, what is helpful to know is that standards and marking things with this came in the 20th century. So this is not going to be an antique ring. This is going to be one that is perfectly sympathetic and can be worn, but it does help you to know a little bit about the piece. We are going to do a little bit of a dive into some of my pieces. We are going to play a dating game with lockets, which we haven't really touched on just yet. But first, I want to check in and make sure I didn't miss any comments. It is lovely to see you all. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Jennifer. Donna, good to see you. Hey, Mia. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining, <laughs> watching on two times the speed to catch up. It works. Yes, Lisa. We have so many members of our community that take wonderful care of their jewelry because these pieces can be worn for years and years to come. And they do truly last a long time. Whether they're antique, vintage, it really is about how you take care of it. It's always good to wipe a necklace once you remove it to remove any oils from the body for the day. And thank you, Jed. Yes, please do hit the thumbs up. I appreciate it. So we're going to take a little bit of a look now at three, well, we'll look at two of these collar necklaces. I'm going to share them with you here. And the purpose is to do a little bit more of a deep dive to help you know what to look for. Now that we've looked at what reproductions look like, we're going to go into each one of these pieces just as a reminder. And again, keep in mind that these pieces can be made in silver. They can be silver plate over base metal. They can be copper. They can be gold filled. They can be rolled gold. So 
a variety of different things. If you're wondering if something is silver or silver plated, it is always best to test and to be able to, to rub, which I don't love doing to antiques, but for things that I am buying or planning on potentially selling, I definitely do test carefully. You can potentially use an XRF as well if you have access to one. Sometimes the pawn shops around you may have one. Um, but something else you can look for is peeling or any greening of the silver that cannot just be polished off with a nice like sunshine cloth. So solid silver, whether it's 835, 900 or sterling should never, never have a peeling appearance to it. So that is always something to look for because you're going to find that as you look for these pieces, the colors are very, very rarely marked. So it is really good to know what you're looking for and to get deep, deep in there. Lisa, I would say that that is probably from the 30s or 40s, this last spring ring that we looked at. So the gold one that is marked. Um, they are still making them today, though, so it could be even newer than that. You could go on Etsy right now and probably find one for about 15 bucks if you need something like that. Um, so always keep that in mind and always shop around. Let's take a look at these necklaces. So the floral one is one of my favorites. I love the width to it. And this is where it is hand engraved. So it is a little bit hard to tell from photographs. It's definitely easier when you're handling these pieces. I'm going to play the video one more time that we initially looked at. Um, there we have it. So you can see front and back are equally beautifully finished. The engraving is chaste and quite deep and it's hand engraved for all of the details on the scalloped component. And again, you're looking for that well-closed closure, like no solder marks, it's impeccably done. So that's one of the telltale signs when you're looking for a piece that is a true antique. This is another example. And this one has what I, I refer to now, as I've learned, the term is cannonball design on the side. And even then you've got um, some nice stamped edges to it. Now this is where you need to be careful because stamping and machine components did exist from the late 19th century onwards. So really it's about the hand finishing of the links. So again, this is one that is all hand finished. It's completely closed off. There's no seams and the ball characteristics also help us date it as well. Now going into the edges, we've got the bolt ring here that is inside of the two fixed pieces. And again, keep in mind that they can be closed off like this or just the book chain with no end, but both ends should be the same. Here's the closure on this bolt ring version. And then here is the closure. We're looking at the Y drop component or Y link, as well as the closure on the necklace as well. So lots of details to get into and to look at. And again, these links are all handmade. They're in intricately detailed. We're going to jump into the dating game next as we look at some pendants. You just saw a sneak preview of where we're headed. Um, but first I want to talk a little bit about these lockets. So lockets were very common because of the desire to put photographs in them. The one I have on, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to, to open this while wearing it. <laughs> Let's see if I can do that. Yep, I'm going to be able to. Amazing. Has two photos, instant ancestors, not to my ancestors, but that's why they were so glorified during the period. People really wanted to be able to carry their family members and loved ones with them. And with the onset and innovation of photography, it became something that was possible. So we are going to take a look at four pendants, three of which are lockets, one is the pendant that came from the Vancouver family. And once again, I'm going to ask you to guess which one you think might be the oldest. Now today, we have a very clear answer because three of these have date marks. So we're going to focus first on looking at the fronts of them. So again, first, I'm going to just show you these. I will play a video for you so that you can get a good look of them with movement because they're quite three-dimensional. Now, these are aesthetic period 
um, which really falls between about the 1860s to about 1900. It goes a little bit later. Um, things don't necessarily change a lot in style quickly in the early 20th century. And that's in part because style was something that was found through newspapers, through publications, through paintings and drawings. There was no such thing as television. So visuals did not travel very fast. Thank you so much for coming, Linda. Take care. Now let's take a look at the video and watch the movement of these beautiful, beautiful pens. <laughs> All right, so first, before we start guessing anything about dates, tell me which one's your favorite. I'm gonna put these up here, A, B, C, and D. A has a very industrial look to it. B is our citrine, C is our buckle, and D I refer to as the dome. <laughs> Thank you so much, Catherine. I'm glad you enjoy the music. It, it makes me smile. Oh, Linda, I promise you will be able to replay it. I really appreciate you joining today. We have quite a few who are saying that C is their favorite. I see B and A as well, some for D. I love seeing what everyone else's taste is too, because I run across everything from industrial to very floral pieces. So it's, it's lovely to see. I see some Ds, some Bs and Cs, A and C. Well, I will say you all have very, very good choice. <laughs> Hey, Emily's going for all four. Wonderful. Thank you so much for humoring me. They are, you know, all, they have a special place in my heart. We're going to dive into each one of them. But the question that we're going to answer next is which of these is going to be the oldest? So if you want to put in your guess for oldest, we're going to begin to explore each one in detail. And then I'm going to give you the answer. We'll start by only taking a glance at the back and then I'm gonna give you all the information you need. So get that guess in there now, please, as to which one you think is the oldest. Cindy, I love that answer, C-A-D-B. All right, the guesses are for C being the oldest so far. I see an A. And this is where it's really interesting to see the dates on these, because sometimes with the more industrial looking pieces, you, you think to yourself, how can this not be something from the 20th century? It's amazing. All right, I am going to begin to unveil some details. So this is A. They've got some nice hallmarking from Birmingham that we're going to dive into in detail, engraved on both front and back. What I will say is there is definitely a fern motif going on on the back, and there was a fervor for ferns during the Victorian era. And we will talk about that with floriography in an upcoming brunch. Um, so the front is all industrial business. The back is extremely floral for A. Here's B, you can take a look at front and back. The bale does close down so that you can wear it as a brooch as well. Very large um, sort of triple prong held citrine in the center, floral hand engraving that's done. Take a look at the closures for some indication on date, may help you a little bit. And I see those guesses still coming in. Thank you all so much for humoring me. This is C, so this one also is stamped for Birmingham. Uh, we've got a beautiful double buckle motif that's very three-dimensional. And then it looks like we've also got some of that firm business going on, engraved into the background, as well as on the bale. And the bale is also stamped, hard to see because of the angle at which I took this photo. So this is the buckle example. And then D is the slightly industrial dome with engravings that really echo a lot of what is in the book chain that I keep showing with the floral detail. Also stamped for Birmingham. And we're going to begin to unveil some of the truth about these. Now this has some really interesting marks which we'll talk about. 
So again, A, B, C, and D, let's reveal the truth. This is A, as we've talked about. And here we can see from the Birmingham mark, and it did not photograph very well, but it is a G, and it is from 1881. Yes, Jagar, these are all mine. And as I go through this and reveal the details on them, I will hold them up as well for you. So here is the first one, 1881, very three-dimensional. I'm going to hold it sideways for you as well so that you can see. Hopefully my computer is not going to restart. I've got some lint <laughs> right at the top. And there you can see all the fern detail, which sometimes people would actually engrave initials or engrave something across the back in addition to this floral work. So this one, again, 1881 sterling. It's remarkably lightweight. It looks like it would be heavy, but it actually probably is only about 15 grams or so, which is not what one would expect when looking at this, because it is quite large, as you can see. All right, the next one we're going to look at after we've unveiled 1881 on our first one is our citrine. So again, the citrine, we've talked about findings in the past, and the findings are the very best indicator on this. So they are completely hand done. Uh, there is a safety clasp on this, and you'll also notice that the findings are round. So although it is like a screw mechanism, you can see from the bottom image on the right-hand side, um, it is a round sort of set of pin and enclosure. And so this is something that was introduced closer to the turn of the century and these safety catches around 1890. So we are dating this one at 1890. And I'll bring it in. Really big citrine, nice old cut to it. It's got a little bit of color banding that you can make through. It is indeed <laughs> mighty, mighty citrine. You know, part of um, what I tried to find in the book from the family this came from is some details like, was there any photos of the family wearing this? And unfortunately there is not, um, but I did learn the family came to Vancouver in 1908 and there was, or actually I should say 1905, there was a very, very big push for immigrants to come to Vancouver then. In 1891, there were only 19,000 people in Vancouver. There were over 200,000 in Montreal, the other side of the country. And then in 1908, by 1908 and 1911, there was about 100,000 people. And what's crazy is that with the war years, the population only expanded by another 17,000 by 1921. So they came, they opened a butcher that was well-established, well-loved. They specialized in cured uh, meats like bacon that was popularized in Scotland, and of course sausages as well as haggis and other things too. So this is our example from 1890. And we're going to move along to C next, which is a giant buckle. <laughs> and you all have seen the book chain that this one belongs on. So let's take a look now. Again, we've got those Birmingham marks that tell us everything we want to know. 1876, it is a B. Um, we can see the details there and I'm going to remove this and hold it up. This is a very large one. Now, this is another one that is quite lightweight, lighter weight than one would expect. It has a little bit of dinging to the back, as you can see, which is not uncommon. It always blows my mind how well-preserved the fronts of lockets can be when the backs are dinged up. Buyer's tip, if you are looking to buy a locket, it is always a great idea to get a video of it or see it with motion so that you can understand, you know, if there is any damage, has it been like indented in a way that is going to compromise the piece? Do you have any concerns? But this one, large and in charge. The findings as well are very typical of the period. You often see findings like this at the top um, on French pieces as well. I don't think this is French, but just want to share that. And I'm going to flip this around, not engraved in the back, not engraved to the top of the bale, just the front, quite sympathetic. We'll hold it sideways too, so that you can really see that construction. I love the workmanship on pieces like this. 
All right. So the date on this again, as we said, it is 1876. And we have just one left to reveal, which is the domed version. Now these dome designs were really, really popular during the, I'm going to call it about 1850s through the 1890s. Very long period, but they were also, also patented during that period because people were trying to use the reflectivity of the dome to reflect the sides. Now here, we know this one is from Birmingham in 1882, and inside the marks, you can also see an early registration mark, and that is another topic we're going to do a full deep dive into. So patents and registrations are fascinating in the UK, and it all began um, in the early 19th century with registration marks similar to what you see. There were two series, and this is from the second series, before they moved into numbers, so R and number, and then ultimately a patent. But you are able to understand, based on these marks, exactly when they were patented by day, month, year, and parcel, which is fascinating. So this beauty is from 1882, and I'm going to put this sideways for you. So often the purpose of the dome was meant to reflect what was on the side, and then there would be some engraving or three-dimensional um, components to it. And so this one is, again, 1882. So for all of you that guessed C, congratulations, you are spot on. That is the oldest one of the bunch. And the others were awfully close in date, <laughs> other than the citrine, but I had to throw in that wild card. Thank you, thank you for playing along. It's always so much fun. Uh, the next thing that I want to do is obviously do a giveaway for one of our Sunday Bobbles mugs. Now, we have a few more things coming up. One, we're going to do a giveaway for this mug. I do have a deal of the day to share with you, and we'll do some online shopping as well. But first, I do want to thank you very, very much, everyone that has joined the Extra Scoop Club. If you want more content like this, and if you want me to cover some of your special pieces, once a month at the Extra Scoop Club, we have a special live for members where I'm going to take you through some of your pieces and photos that have been sent to me, and we're going to do a deep dive. Now, in order to win this mug today, all you have to do is type hashtag win, all caps, as is scrolling on the bottom of the page, and I will enter you automatically through the StreamYard giveaway tool, and we're going to do a draw. So please do type hashtag win for your chance to get your very own Sunday Bobbles mug. It will be shipped to you completely free of charge. And yes, it is wonderful to see how well you are all doing in these quizzes. I am definitely seeing you get a lot of these right. It's very impressive. So much fun to do these. Thank you so much for being here. Now this mug is 20 ounces. You can put anything you like in it, hot or cold, but it's one of my favorites. We'll give you all a few moments to get that entered. And while you enter, I am going to show you the deal of the day. So today's deal of the day is an Arts and Crafts era Moonstone ring, and it is available by one of the YouTube sellers, Gina Gay. I'll add it to the stream. So she is asking 200 USD for this beautiful Moonstone ring, and it's a size five and a half. I'm going to stop the scrolling of the banner for just a moment so you can actually see her email address. If you're interested, please get in touch with her at mybag05 at yahoo.com. She can answer any questions for you. Um, I love this ring. I love the construction of it. And this is very typical of the arts and craft era. Again, you see some of that ball design that has come through from the Victorian period. Those double banding in the back. It's really very, very beautiful. So I am going to... Resume the banner. There we go. Make sure that you get those entries in. I'm going to catch up on the comments. <laughs> good morning, Gina. It is good to see you. I've bought a few pieces from Gina, and I have always been very pleased. All right. And if you are looking for a Moonstone ring, that is a, a gosh darn good value, too. You can look it up yourself and you will see some details. So I'm going to check on the giveaway screen. We have 23 entries so far. Don't be afraid to enter if you are overseas, no matter where you're located. I will cover the cost of shipping should you win. These will be shipped directly to you. They're essentially drop shipped. So feel free to enter. 
Sunday Bobbles mug all for you. We'll give it about 10 more seconds and then I'm going to do the draw. We've got 24 entries now. I will share my screen once I stop the banner. And here it comes. All right, let's do a countdown. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and I am drawing for the winner. Good luck all. Our winner is Brie Ha Ha Ha. What a joyful name. If you will please get in touch with me at sundaybobbles at gmail.com, that would be perfect. Um, and just send me your shipping information and I will be sure to get that sent off to you. Congratulations very much to that. I'm going to write this down. Fantastic to see new names coming up in the giveaways. Congratulations. All right, friends, it is now time to do some of the online shopping with me. And I am curious, are there any special requests from anyone today? Otherwise, we can look for book chains. It is always fun to do. I spend a fair bit of time looking at lockets and book chains myself. <laughs> it is such a joyful username. I love it too. Bri ha ha ha. <laughs> yes. My email address is sundaybobbles at gmail.com and it is written inside uh, the text, the description of the video too, in case you forget what it is. So please just get in touch and we'll get you all set. And in the meantime, everyone else, think about what you'd like me to look for. Looks like book chains with lockets can absolutely do. We will begin with that. I'm going to head over to um, my favorite site, <laughs> which is gem.app, lockets from the 1800s as well, flapper beads. Okay, looks like we definitely have a starting point. Let's do it. I am going to go to gem.app now. Share my screen. All right, we're gonna begin with book chain. And I'm refreshing it because I already had it queued up to go this morning. Um, and let's see. Now I'm gonna look for a combination of what is a good deal and a great piece, and we will span all eras. Okay, now this is a real beauty. I have to click on it. It is indeed a Victorian sterling locket and fancy book chain. Um, so this is actually a really good example of one that does not have the closed round openings at the end, but rather just the finished off book chain, like leaf to it. So I'm going to open this and we are going to look at this one in detail just so that you can see the um, sort of details on this. Uh, let me see if she has a video. Nope. Okay. Let's zoom in. So do you see how essentially we have that book binding type closure right here? Hopefully you can see me hovering. Now this is appropriate for a Victorian period piece. And what's beautiful is that this locket and the engraving that is on the book chain itself appear to be absolutely correct and a great match. Again, it looks like it's part of that fern that was oh so popular. Um, I am going to scroll on to the next photo. Um, beautiful ball detailing. So something I do when I am looking at anything is that I do actually count the balls <laughs> to make sure that everything is present and nothing is missing. And we can see this one also has some hallmarking on it too. So we can see Birmingham and that looks like it's either an A or a B. So not that far off from the locket that I have in my collection too. This is a beautiful piece. It is a bit on the expensive side. So I am going to go back and we are going to see if we can find ourselves a better deal. Catherine, thank you so much for coming. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. And thank you so much for your super thanks. It was greatly appreciated. 
Cindy, I see your question. Different types of jade and how to tell the best quality just from pictures. Okay, that is going to be a full topic that we're going to need to cover because jade is different quality based on color and then also based on treatment. So there's things to look for to see if it's potentially been dyed or waxed, but I'm going to take that away and we will cover that in the future. I'm going to make notes right now. Now let's keep going. Okay, we're looking for a good deal and a beautiful locket. Now I typed book chain, but as we're seeing some of these things like this are not book chains. Again, we've got that inspired later book chain look over here. And then this is very common for the Art Deco in 1940s to have wonderful dangles on a book chain motif. These pieces are not inexpensive, but you can sometimes find a deal. This one looks like it may very well be a reproduction piece at $40. I'm going to click on it and see what they say. Yes, stainless steel, bold book chain look. Um, we can also tell based on the way that it's been closed. So one is the bold, the other not. And then there's a lobster claw too. This is a, definitely a modern piece. For $40, it's a lot of look, but maybe not exactly what you're looking for. Now, this one here, I'm going to take a look at. I'm intrigued by how they have put the locket on this, because the locket is generally put on the ring. What is going on here? It looks like they've slipped it over the chain itself. Um, this one's available on Ruby Lane. I am so tempted to want to slip that locket all the way around. So this one is 798 Canadian dollars. If I do some quick math, I suspect that's around 525 USD for both chain and locket. Um, and it looks like we have an upside down N for Birmingham. Let's take a look at the listing itself. So this one's from Cambridge Antiques, ooh, 595 USD is what they're looking for. And in their listing, they do tell us that it is dated 1894, 18 inches. That is the other thing you should always look for. Book chains can be uh, from like 15 and a half to 18 inches. So just double check to make sure that it's going to fit you. You can always add more bolt rings or spring rings if you want. Um, to, to extend it, but this one, it's hard to see some of the detail. So I'm going to keep looking. We'll go back to gem.app. That's not a terrible deal for both book chain and locket based on what I've seen on the market lately. Okay, so this one here for $4,000, I'm just going to click on it for a moment. Celebration of Love Gold Double Locket Necklace. It is beautiful, but it looks like um, it's got a sort of a different closure, which is typical to pieces that do have this double look to it. We did see some in the catalog from 1877. I'm going to just click through this. And it's got some hair in it and a note. I love but the very nice sentimental piece. Now, this looks like it's been a little bit kind of fabricated and put together. And there's the painting. So I do wonder if that was an earlier piece that was added in. There's a lot going on on this necklace. Anytime that I'm wanting to invest this kind of money in something, I generally would want to see it in person. So we're going to keep going. <laughs> All right. Oh, and do let me know if you prefer to look for sterling or for um, gold filled, rolled gold. So let's look at this one. We can definitely see the links on this. And this is a beautiful Coro bracelet. Um, are that stamped sort of factory made and very well done. It is beautiful. Nice panel piece that covers the entire wrist. This looks like a nice piece. Um, for, I'm going to call it a retro, Art Deco to retro period, most likely. Let's share this tab instead. I'll tell you where it is. 
So it is available at Prairie Vintage Jewels. Apparently they're based in Canada. So my Canadian friends, if you are looking to not have to worry about anything for customs and duties, this one could be for you. Let's take a look at their photos in detail. $39 is roughly, I'm gonna say about 29 USD. Looks like there's a little bit of wear to the metal, but still perfectly wearable. Yeah, you can see some of the metal has worn off on the prongs and you can see some of the color that has started to come off on the details here. And this is why I like to zoom in. I really do love to do my online shopping on my desktop computer because it lets me see these details far better than if I was shopping just on my phone. So sometimes I do end up going from phone to desktop just to make sure that I can see all the details. Yep, and this actually allows us to see some of that wear a lot better. This helps explain the price on it, but it is still a nice piece for the look. I know some people are very excited about some of the markers that are available now that can be used to fix the finish on things. So if that's something that you're into, this may be easily repairable. Let's keep looking and see what else we can find. We're also looking for 1880 lockets. Ooh, this is a beautiful piece. I'm just gonna click on it because I can't help myself. <laughs> uh, this is, they say, an 1880 antique silver Egyptian revival bird wing collar. Jump onto this photo. It is a really good look. I'm, a, I'm quite fond of this, but this is definitely not in budget. It has a lot going on. Okay, let's keep going. I think this one is going to be a gold fill example. Um, this is a Victorian one and it's tricolor. So this is something that was definitely seen a lot was beautiful tones of that rose yellow and green gold together in nice foliate details. And this one has a photo of a beautiful child inside. There you can see the leaves. And you can also see some tiny little trefoils too, right in this area, intricately made. And it looks like it has a nice initial locket on it. Uh, do they tell us anything about what it says? Reading these lockets can be a fun challenge. And I think this one's going to be an AEI, but there's not a clear picture of that one. So. This is still a bit, you know, it, it, it's within the price range that you see right now for the gold fill pieces, but you can find a better deal. So I'm going to keep looking. But if you are interested, sorry, I should tell you who the seller is. It is Seal a Deal at Etsy. I tend to get distracted sometimes. Okay, 871 Canadian for a large locket with some ball findings. And why don't we take a look at this one from Ruby Lane. This one's at Lulu's, 650 USD. And I'm hoping that we can get in a little closer. All right, so we have a bird that's been engraved. This is definitely typical for the aesthetic period. And then you do see that cannonball ball detailing all around the outside. Again, make sure that you go in and you also count the cannonballs on the detail of the chain, which we'll take a look at in just a second. I like that we can see the back and that it's taken outside. So it's very clear that there's not any massive dinging or anything to be concerned about. And again, the inside, what's interesting is that I'm seeing the more lockets that I look at, sometimes they are engraved with the same numbers front and back. Um, which makes me think that it's part of their, or was part of the construction process. We can see the same finding from my buckle locket on the top of this one. And again, you've got these beautifully formed circles, as well as the chain link or book chain link detail with the balls. Looks like some are engraved. Every second one is engraved. 
nice leaf detail. So if you were in the market for this piece, what I would say you should do is that you should very carefully inspect all up the side on the outside first, and then on the inside second, to see if any of the cannonball detailing is missing. Looks pretty good to me. So again, if you are interested in this one, Lulu's on Ruby Lane. Now, Black Hills Gold, I see that question from Jay Gar, is um, something that's been around for a while. I'm going to have to find the exact date for you, but the like multicolor gold technique has been around for, I would say, well over 150 years because the color of gold is influenced based on the additives in it. So the more copper, the more red or rose that it looks, I believe it may be zinc that makes it go a little bit green and nickel is what made the early versions go a little bit white. So depending on how it was uh, formulated, that would influence the color. And that's in part why they say that continental gold is generally rosier. It's because of what is in it, which is fascinating. Are there book chain bracelets? Yes, there are, but all book chain bracelets that I've found to date are uh, 20th century, so revival pieces. So here is another one. And this one's got that ball detail as well as the chain. And a nice big locket that has the aesthetics period engraving that is done. It's almost the Japanese style crane. And then you've got some bamboo. Beautiful. I'm going to do Black Hills Gold as my takeaway so that I can add that into the community tab so that we can all learn when Black Hills Gold as the company was invented and when they first started manufacturing. But I've got some pieces that are marked um, 1880 that do have little rose gold and green gold and yellow gold leaves and details applied. All right, let's click on this one. This one is a brass choker. Yep, so this is definitely a revival piece, not true antique. Cindy, thank you so much for joining. I appreciate it. Yes, for all those who are interested, please do join the Extra Scoop Club for some extra fun. We will do live events once a month um, so that I can go through your photos in detail, antique roadshow style. It'll be lots of fun. Now, this is an interesting one. They call it an antique book chain bracelet. The construction is absolutely gorgeous. We were just talking about antique bracelets. Is it possible that uh, they were book chain bracelets too? and the construction looks good on this. What's interesting though, is that it comes with earrings and I'm almost wondering if they have taken apart a necklace in order to fabricate a bracelet because while I have seen dog clips on some necklaces, they tend to look like they were added as an afterthought. So this is pretty unusual to me. It's beautiful. It's from 342 for gold filled. If it's been updated, hmm, up to you if that's something that you want to spend but I don't think that this one began its life as a bracelet. Now, this is an interesting one. So typically these Victorian pieces, if they closed in the front like this, um, often they would have like a tongue in groove clasp that would kind of plug itself right in. So it looks like there's been something maybe done with this. It is very hard for these pieces to stay together over the years. Um, so this definitely does not look like it belonged there once upon a time. It's not a bad look, but there's a little bit of damage on the locket. The necklace itself is quite beautifully engraved. Let's keep going. We know from what we've talked about that this one here is most certainly a revival piece from the 20th century. Okay, let's click on this one. 
So actually, let's click on this one. This one appears to be a very good price, and I want to know why. Um, 194 Canadian dollars. This one's available on Etsy. Ooh, it's in five baskets from Red Fern Vintage Resale. Uh, let's go through it in detail. It is likely going to be gold fill. I'm going to start by playing their video. You can see that it is the proper book chain construction with regards to the link, so it looks like it's properly closed. It reminds me very much of the one I have. This is actually a very good price, so I have a feeling it will sell very quickly. Um, let's take a look at the details in case any of you are interested. Okay, so I'm going to zoom in here. We've got an early fan motif on the locket. And again, we've got a couple of those different colors of gold. And this is what I was referring to is that early thumb ring. This Y drop is as one would expect. And the links well engraved. Now, I can't tell if there was a little repair done here or not. So let's see if we can get in to a couple more there. Nope, it looks like they're made in the same way on both sides, which is definitely one of the indicators that we're looking for. Um, it does look like perhaps there's a little gap, though, in the construction right here. So just want to call that out. But overall, it looks to be in pretty good condition. And for this price, I'm actually quite surprised. Um, looks like some early photos are included. And the patina is overall in pretty, and finish in pretty good condition too. Not a bad deal. This may need to be added as sort of a secondary deal of the day. So again, this one is at Redfern Vintage Resale. Let's read their details. It's 18 inches in length. The locket fob is an extra three inches. Uh, good working order, contains two pictures, locket appears to be marked, and there's a tulip and feather. All hand assembled flat links as you're looking for. Yeah, so I would say this one looks pretty gosh darn good. For all those interested again, Redford Vintage Resale. I am going to go back to gem.app. Now, comparatively, let's look at this one right next to it for almost 10 times the price. They say it is nine karat gold. That would help explain it, absolutely. There were not a lot that were made in solid gold. And so if you are in the market for a solid gold book chain, definitely make sure that you're getting it from a reputable source um, and definitely get it tested once you get it home as well, because that's gonna be a pretty significant investment. Now, let's take a look at this chain here for 562 Canadian dollars at Smots Silver. So this is a very typical look from the Victorian period, these wonderful star stamping details. Looks like they've got a video too. It is 18 and 7 eighths inches. If you remember from the presentation, this very much looks like the collar that had like a fabric-like appearance when it was laying on the neck of one of the sitters. And there's some ball details in here. Let's see where that sits. I'm betting it's going to be at the end. Yes, where you would want to put your spring ring in order to close it. So this one's 583 Canadian. I'm guessing that's probably around 4 20 or so USD at Smots Silver. Let's see what they say. Remarkable condition, 23 grams, hair over three eighths of an inch wide, hand fabricated. They bought it in early 1990s at a shop in Camden Passage. Guaranteed silver, no hallmarks, which is fairly typical. Okay. 
was an, is an interesting one. It is not a terrible price as far as book chains go. The best value that I've been able to find on a book chain to date, I'm going to put myself back up for a second. Um, the best value that I've been able to find is a book chain for about $200 USD. Um, and it is rare to find them in that price point. So I would suggest if you are very eager in finding one at a great price, take the time to look. It, it's the same with everything. Eventually, good things will come to you, but it may take some work. Um, in the I would say three to six hundred dollar USD. There seems to be a fair bit that's available, so keep your eyes open and think about what it is that you really want. If you've never owned a, a collar necklace like this before, I would suggest trying some on if you can at all, or even um, buying some of the newer reproduction to make sure that it's a look that you're going to love. It is a very specific look. I'm going to hold up this wider one that I have just to give you an idea because it is bold and it doesn't work with every outfit. So depending on the collar of your necklace, um, it can be quite thick and almost look like you have an extra collar on. So keep that in mind because sometimes, and I'm sure this has happened to some of you too, you fall in love with the look of something and then you bring it home and you put it on your body and you're like, hmm, is this the right look for me? So keep that in mind for sure. And also measure and find out where do you like your pendant to hit and what size pendant do you like? because not everyone wants a huge pendant and not everybody wants a tiny one either. So what never hurts is to create one yourself as well. What I like to do is take paper and take the measurements of a piece and actually hand craft the piece of jewelry and like put it on my body. So for example, that necklace that said it was three eighths of an inch wide. Uh, it's not uncomfortable, but I will tell you that I, don't like to do activities in my jewelry like this, especially antiques, where I'm sweating and like walking home because I don't want to add acids and salt to the body as well. Hey, Timeless Jewels by Deborah, thank you so much for joining. Um, I, I prefer to make sure that I'm not sweating. I, I treat them the same way as I would my pearls. So if I'm wearing this to work and I'm walking home from work, which is a nice 45 minute walk, I will take off my jewelry, store it properly in my bag. It's quite smooth. I will show you um, this necklace, for example. In the hand, it's it's fairly rigid because of the structure of the links. But this gold filled one, if you look at it, it is extremely slinky because of the structure of the links on this one. So you can almost like ball it up in your hand. Emily, that is a great tip. It definitely makes sense to go to the store and feel them in your hand. Exactly. So like this is fairly typical. The one that I'm wearing right now does the same thing. This one is extremely articulated and smooth, but because of the way the links lock, when I store it, I tend to wrap it more. So definitely touch them, feel them if you can. Um, if there happens to be like an antique fair around you or an antique mall that you can go to, you'll find that sellers are extremely friendly and they usually love to talk about their treasures much like we all do as well. Okay, shall we continue shopping and look for some antique sterling pendants or silver pendants? I think we should. Let's return to gem.app. I will share my screen again. <laughs> yes, Jagar, I am known for all of my jewelry. In fact, my boss a couple weeks ago was taking photos of my earrings. She was like, oh, I love your earrings. I want to have a pair just like that made, <laughs> which made me laugh so hard. Uh, I don't mind. Okay, let's share this. We are going to look for antique lockets and we're going to keep our eyes open for silver lockets. Now let's begin with this one. It says antique gold filled etched locket, not our silver locket that we had in mind. We'll keep going. Now this is a really nice selection. I'm just going to pause here to look at it. It looks like it's on eBay. If you are someone who may be a reseller or who loves antique lockets, uh, this is quite a nice lot. 
<laughs> so I'm just going to share it for a second. It is Love and Light 4 on eBay, and it looks like there are a few pieces here. I've got a lion. This one here is going to be sterling. We can tell that it is Birmingham, although it is definitely rubbed. The others are likely to be gold filled. But this is the one that is sterling. Beautiful Art Nouveau lady. Looks like all stones are present. Fairly nice selection of, I would say, like right around 1900 lockets. So interesting little bunch. Maybe able to make a little bit of money on this. I'm not clear if there is a ding on this one or not. It looks like it may have a small indentation to the top. That would be the one thing to note. All right, let us go back. I couldn't help but go into that. Sometimes when you see a little lot like that, you can really luck out. Okay, I'm gonna go to this lock because this looks like an amazing, oh boy. <laughs> um, quite an amazing lot. Let's, oops, share this tab instead. We're going to go here. There we go. Okay, so this one has one day and four hours left. And why I'm excited first is because this style brooch is something that I collect. It looks like there's a deer that's been engraved on it. Um, and it's got almost like the, the sun outside. The pin is extended. It is probably likely around 1880 in date. In the lot, you also have a wonderful hand that is used sometimes to hold lockets and things. You've got some Pietra Dura, which is, yeah, this appears to be a little bit of a bargain of a lot. So when you're looking at Pietra Dura, you want to check and see it is inlaid stone. Um, is anything chipped? Is anything missing? And that looks quite good. Then you've got another nice T bar hinge clasp. It looks like another piece that may have a little opal in it. Little lace pins. A brooch with a little heart pendant. What looks to be maybe a piece of agate. And then a fob, a spinner fob on the side. Let's see if they show us the backs. This one may be some sort of coin holder. Engraved. Looks like the Pietra Dura is a clip and there's something marked on it, but I cannot see what it is. But it looks to be in pretty good shape. And clips like this work really well as necklaces too. If you want to like pop them onto a chain or a torque, um, that is something that I've done. All right, well, without knowing much about this lot, for a brooch like this one alone, which is probably one of my favorite things in this lot, um, normally I would expect to pay like 60 USD to up to like 90 USD for it. So $76, 28 bids, looks like there's gonna be a little bit of competition, but overall, this Love and Light 4, same seller that we just look at, appears to have some pretty good little lots to go to. So maybe keep that in mind if any of you are looking for some little lots to to share. <laughs> I may just have to go back and bid later. We will see. But I need to be on my best behavior because I am trying to save my money for moving. <laughs> now let's go here. This is not a super early locket. It is a 1940s sterling for 235 Canadian on Etsy. Let me know in the comments, is it confusing to see pricing in Canadian dollars for those of you that are in the U.S.? So this is a 1940s style or 1940s period. This is also a really great tip um, that the seller has put in. If you shop on Etsy and you put something into your cart or favorite it. Sometimes the sellers will sell you, send you a coupon code. So if you're not sure on something or maybe hoping for a little bit of a better deal, definitely like put a heart on it. 
um, or add it to your cart. Okay, great. I'm glad that you no one's struggling too much with the pricing. I know that it can be a little bit hard sometimes when it's Canadian dollars, UK dollars, UK dollars, it's not even a thing, uh, US dollars or um, British pounds, euros, etc. I'll do my best to try to keep it really clear. I am going to go back here and make sure that I'm sharing the right tab. Yes, I am. So we are looking for antique lockets and we are not seeing a whole lot of silver ones. I might add more details into this. Let's antique silver lockets so that it's more specific. Well, I'm intrigued by this one. What is on the front? Hmm. Unfortunately, it looks like the bale is missing. So even though it is only $30, this is probably not the right one for any of us, unless we're silversmiths. But here is one. It is a silver plate horseshoe. So I don't love the look of the bale. It's a bit twisted. And I prefer not silver plate for me personally. This one is very similar to the dome locket that I have. Now, I have a feeling with some of these dome lockets. The domes don't tend to stay in pristine condition. And what I've noticed is that sometimes people have started to engrave them in order to hide some of the condition issues that happen. I can't say for sure whether that's the case with this one or not, but this one's 292 Canadian and it does look like it has a little bit of detail to the reverse, but primarily on the front. Um, do you see what I mean? I, it feels like the engraving was meant to hide some dinging on this one. Hello, Mary, great to see you. I'm gonna keep looking. Okay, I like this one, but I wanna take a look at it. For 213 Canadian, probably about 130 or 40 USD on Ruby Lane, We've got all sorts of floral engravings. So definitely in floriography, there would be a lot to say about that. We've got leaves, looks like ferns and ivy, some flowers too. Um, a great big monogram in the back and it's marked sterling. Now they're calling it Victorian, but the bale feels a little bit later. Um, this type of engraving was pretty common in the early deco period, like late Edwardian, early deco period. And the sterling mark has me questioning if it's truly Victorian, which means pre-1901 or not. But this one is on Ruby Lane and it's in Canada. Uh, looks like Timeless Antique and Vintage Jewelry has this one. If anyone is interested, it is one and a quarter inches wide by two inches tall, which is fairly nice in terms of the size. I like a big locket. We are gonna keep going. Okay, now lockets like this are sometimes referred to as Victorian, but keep in mind that if you don't see um, the dates on the UK pieces, the UK was pretty good about hallmarking them. Uh, and if it, it, and it looks like it's almost too new and too good to be true or not appropriately detailed. So really look for those Victorian type flowers. There is a chance that it is going to be a later piece. Okay, here's a buckle. And this one comes on a chain. Let's take a look. For $6.95 Canadian. It's on Etsy. The seller is Vintage Jewelry Vault 1. So if you are looking for a buckle locket, it does come with a chain. I'm not going to kind of looks like it's that slinkier version of the book chain like we saw in the presentation where some of the women were wearing just a thin thin chain in order to hold their locket 
Hey, Diana, great to see you. The back looks like it's in relatively good condition. I'm not seeing a lot of dings. There's the inside. I just wish there was more of a close up of the buckle itself. So let's get in as close as we can. It looks like all of the three dimensional pieces are there. It is offset at an angle like mine is. Maybe that's what drew me to this one. I do like this one. Not bad at all. Let's keep going. Okay, let's look at this beauty here. This is a really nice chain. I'm going to pop into Etsy so that we can zoom in and look at the details. So $6.95 Canadian for both the chain as well as the locket. And we are going to do some zooming and make sure that the balls are there. You want to make sure that they're present. I can already see that some are missing, which is a shame. So here's what I'm talking about. When you see something, make sure that you zoom in. Um, do you see right here, there's one ball that's missing. There's another one that's missing right down near the spring clasps. Now it's symmetrical in this case, it's missing, missing on both sides, but this other one is not. So it's always good to inspect them in detail. That may be something that could be repaired, and it may also be something that doesn't bother you a lot because it, it is a tiny detail, and likely no one's going to be breathing down your neck in order to look at your book chain. The design, this is sometimes referred to almost as like a zipper-like design, where there's like a zipper-type look on both sides, and it is partially gated, so the chain links themselves are part open. It is very beautiful. Shame about the ball. The price is not terrible. There's some monogramming on the back. So if you're, but they've styled it in an interesting way as well. So I personally would not put both hoops like this together. I would just have one hoop have all three loops. So the loop of the pendant bail as well as the two chains. That's how I tend to wear them. But you can wear it this way and it would be a little bit easier to take on and off. Two more missing on the bottom left. Let's take a look on the bottom left. I'm gonna go back one photo. Yeah, there's definitely a few little beads that are missing, so. Just keep that in mind if this is one that you're looking into for yourself. We will keep looking to see if we can find one in better condition because condition really is important when it comes to antique jewelry. And I'm keeping my eye out for a good deal on the locket. Now this is one that's caught my eye for a few reasons. I think it's just really beautiful. The chain though, it's not what I would expect to see. I feel like this was potentially put together after the fact where someone repurposed a brooch <laughs> and they've added a loop to it and they've used the hinge on the brooch in order to add a chain uh, and then they've added a locket to it. So some would refer to this as being repurposed. In the jewelry world, some refer to them as Franken jewels. There's a way to do them sympathetically and I do think it's quite beautiful, but let's check to see if this was disclosed. Aha, so hooray. I absolutely adore it when someone says exactly what it is. Repurposed antique brooch pin locket. It gives me much greater faith in the seller and, and more of a willingness to be looking through someone's additional items. Um, nice motif. We will keep looking. Here's a chain, $3.95, that'll make it right around $300 uh, can, uh, USD. This one's from Mercy Madge in the UK. Now, I'm just gonna get in close to this and see the video.
What I don't love about these style is that they are easily reproduced. So it's beautiful. But for me, because I know that I can get modern teams that are very, very similar to this, I'm less inclined to go for this style. The price is not bad at all. It's 17 and three quarters inches, sterling silver, not marked. If this is for you, feel free to visit Mercy Madge on Etsy. I feel like she may have a, a website as well. Mid-Victorian Sterling Silver Locket from Belmont and Bellamy on Etsy. We will go here next. So this one is all hand engraved. We're going to look at the next photos. If they will load. There we go. You can see the inside. Now, it looks like this is some sort of plastic. It does not look like glass. I want to see if there's any marks or anything on this one because I think that it is Victorian style and their their title says style too. Yeah. And they do say it is from the 1990s, which is in line with what it appears to be. So just the general construction on this, um, can everybody see how it has like almost two smooth lines and the the way that the engraving is executed, it's not quite the same three-dimensionality as what one would expect in a Victorian piece. Uh, and we do see this in some of the later pieces or reproduction pieces too. So good on them for disclosing that. It is properly listed. We are going to go back to the drawing board because for that price, you can find true antique pieces as well. Let's visit this one. This is, is what they're saying is an Edwardian silver locket. It's three dimensional. I kind of like this one. Victorian Sentiments is the seller. And we can see that there is uh, all the hallmarks that are present. Let's visit this one. Yes, Jack, I totally agree with you. Sometimes sellers totally overclean things. Um, and it can be very misleading because you can get something that is truly an antique, that it has been polished in a way that you think it was made yesterday. Um, I personally do love some patina, <laughs> but I've run into that experience too, where people have sent me cleaned things. Okay. Now, I kind of like this one. I'm going to zoom into the details. We are not here for the chain. We are here for the pendant. Again, that cannonball detail. And you've got all sorts of floral details. It almost looks like a basket with a roof. The hallmarking on it is for Birmingham. The inside's nice and clean, but it looks like somebody has put um, just like a little piece of card in there, which is pretty typical really nice details and it does look hand fabricated because things are just slightly offset and we can see it appears to be a, an f and birmingham so let us look up the date i'm going to share a different tab with you. Here we are. I have quite a few tabs open. So it looks like an F for Birmingham, maybe 1880. I think that that is likely conducive to what it is. So a nice locket from 1880. I love seeing hands next to it too, because it gives you an idea of the size. We'll read the size. Now they're saying 1908. So I'm wondering if they're seeing a different date or a different letter than what I'm seeing. Oop. So here in the listing, 
They're saying 1908. And I'm intrigued. So let's go back to Birmingham. Silver date marks. We are going to go back. Birmingham date letters. If they're saying 1908. They are saying that it is an I. Now we will go here, take a look together. It may indeed be an I, and this is why it does help when you've got good listings from sellers. Perfect. So always read the listing, do your own lookup, read the listing again. I think that is a good lesson. Never just assume and uh, never simply go by what they say, neither should you just go by a quick glance. Always make sure that you do that research too. All right, I am coming back here. I need to close a few of my tabs because I've got about 25 open from the things that we've looked at and it's getting a bit too busy. What else would you all like us to look for? Nineteen oh eight is most definitely antique. By the way, in in the world of antique and vintage, um, everyone agrees that a hundred years is antique. Most people will agree that fifteen year fifty years and older are vintage. Some people try to push thirty or even twenty years. I personally feel like that was not. Um, it's too it's too recent. So the full URL for those marks. It is silvermarks.co.uk, and I'm going to throw that into the comments right now. Um, if you do a quick Google for whatever um, the, the letter date is, if you know for sure that it's Birmingham, um, which is the anchor, then you can type Birmingham date letter mark and then type that letter, and it's going to take you immediately to the page. Otherwise, the silvermakers.co.uk is excellent because it also includes all of the details on what to look for in order to identify the city where something was assayed. So here, I'm going to share this tab instead. So these folks are great for both maker marks and hallmarks. If you go to hallmark identification here, then you're going to be able to see each of the different regions of where things were being hallmarked. So we've got Birmingham, Chester, Dublin, Edinburgh, Exeter, Glasgow, London, Newcastle, and Sheffield, as well as York. And then once you have identified what the region is where something has been hallmarked, you're going to be able to click in in order to find the letters of what you're looking for. Oh, and you know what? I don't think I was sharing my screen. Was I sharing it? <laughs> no, I was not. Let me take you through that again. When you go to the website, silvermakers.co.uk, you're going to be able to see all of the locations. What you can do is then click on Hallmark Identification, identify the region. We were looking at Birmingham because it was the anchor. And then if you know the letter, you're able to look it up if you're not sure which letter it is. So for that last example that we were looking at, it was kind of a smudged eye. What you can do is you can actually pull it up and then you can do a little bit of looking like this. So they were saying it was 1908 for the eye. Um, with the smudging, though, it could very well have been 1883 as well. Let me check to see if I still have my tab open. Oh, I do. Okay, fantastic. So we're going to go back and revisit that locket for just a second. So they've said 1908. And I'm going to make sure that I'm showing the right tab. Good. And so let's zoom in because there's two things you need to look at. You need to look at the letter and then you also need to look at the shape that is around the letter too. Um, so 
I think we all can agree this is an eye. It's a little bit smudged. And we want to be careful and look at the detail on it. So see how it has a little tail that's pointing upwards to the right? Now we're going to look back at the Birmingham site. Perfect. OK. Now they're saying 1908, but this one has no little tail pointing upwards. It is just perfectly flat. And I am inclined to think that this is still an 1883 antique locket. We're gonna click here to see an example. So there we can see an example of a photograph that somebody took. Um, the little head, which is there, is a Victoria head. And that was sometimes on like some special years, but not always used. So that's why they have two different lines and listings. And we're going to go back to that Etsy listing one last time so that we can zoom in one more time. So most definitely, it is not a flat bottom on this eye. I definitely would say that it is pointing up the top as well sort of has that serif-like marks. So we're going to go back to Birmingham one more time and also look at the shape of the cartouche. I'm going to call it a cartouche, but that is surrounding. Like, Notice that it is not like a circle. There's kind of an oblong shape surrounding there. Let's go back here. And again, we have more of that oblong shape. So I'm inclined to say that it is not actually 1908. Thank you for asking about the link. That was a really good example. Um, so, hey, for anybody that is interested in, in truly an antique and quite antique locket, let's go back here. Victorian Sentiments has one available. It's 222.84 Canadian, probably about 160 USD. Um, again, always look, look again. I think that that was a really good example. So thank you for, for drawing our attention to it. I'm gonna remove this. Mia, thank you so much for joining. So there we go. It looks like others agree as well. <laughs> you load the castles. Perfect. I'm just going to scroll up and see what comments I've missed. And that's why if you are in the market for an antique, make sure that you have a little bit of time to look, do your homework, look again. Gina is agreeing that true vintage is 50 years. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Delia, for letting me know that you couldn't see my screen. I was like off in my own land explaining things, did not have enough tabs closed. Jagar agrees. Jack Dean agrees. 1883. All right. Is there anything else that you all would like to look at today? Yes. Sometimes the, the anger can be a bit tricky because it can be positioned in different ways. Um, you, you definitely want to look at like the shape, the direction, the letters, all of the details in the letters. And sometimes it is not easy, especially if there's a lot of patina on pieces when you're looking at them in photos. Um, so make the best educated, informed decision that you can. And what I like to do to avoid disappointment is I always err on the side of caution and I, I hold the highest hope for something. Um, but I know that I'll still, I'll buy if I know that I'll still be satisfied if it is not what I'm hoping for. So. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Emily. Hooray. We, we've, I think the group concurs. Now, any last requests for me to search on? I do have one takeaway, which is my homework on Jade for a future live. And I am making note of that. Uh, sure. So I don't have an Etsy shop. I have a Shopify store. There's almost nothing in stock right now, but it is just sundaybobbles.com. I promise I will eventually add some more things into the shop, but I, I tend to do it very slowly. Every second Tuesday with Sue at Denim to Diamonds, I do a, an auction with her and I bring some things and I've been slowly purging from my, my collection. And it's, you know, when a collector gives something up, <laughs> it tugs at their heartstrings. So Sue is over at Denim to Diamonds. I'm going to pull up her channel. It'll just take me a second to do this. So please bear with me 
I want to share it with you all too. She is an excellent seller, someone who I have bought a lot of wonderful treasures from. Um, and it's a lot of fun to be live with her every second Tuesday. So not, sorry, Monday, not this Monday coming up, but the following. And she also sells on Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 4 p.m. PST. Here is Sue's channel thrown into the chat. Yeah. Good question though. Thank you for asking. Okay. Well then I think that is everything for today. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to get in touch. It's sundaybobbles at gmail.com. And um, I will be sending out a poll for the extra scoop members on June 15th so that we can choose our date and time to do our antique roadshow style deep dive. Um, you are welcome to send me images of things that you'd like me to look at. If there's anything that you have questions on, I'm happy to answer. And again, thank you so much for joining. It is a pleasure to share how I research things, how I look at things, it's items from my collection. It's just a joy. So I love being able to share this with people like you. Hope to see you again very soon. Our next Sunday brunch is going to be two weeks from today on the 25th, topic to be announced. So I will get an event poster up on uh, YouTube within the next few days. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you all for your support and I will see you again soon. Have a wonderful weekend.